From the launch of the original PlayStation to the start of the PlayStation 5 and everything in between, there was one studio that was so unique and so creative with the various games, it gave PlayStation a unique Eastern flair in the market, and that was Japan Studio. After Sony formed their internal PlayStation division, Japan Studio was created in Tokyo on November 16th, 1993. It was comprised of members from the Sony Corporation and Sony Music Entertainment. The studio was to be run like Sony's music business, with creative talent being sought out to develop new games for the original PlayStation, something Sony still does today with the studios it works with. This will lead to such games like Parappa the Rapper by Masaya Matsura. While Japan Studio developed a number of their own games, it was also common for them to co-develop or assist in development like with the Everybody's Golf series by Clapands. Shuhei Yoshida is an important figure for PlayStation. He's been attached to PlayStation from its conception and is still with the PlayStation brand today. From 1996 to 2000, Shuhei Yoshida led Japan Studio. There he would produce many classic Japan Studio titles such as The Legend of Dragoon and Ape Escape, titles whose legacies are still remembered today. Japan Studio also housed a number of internal development teams. Sugar and Rockets, previously known as Exact, developed classics such as the Jumping Flash series and a highly praised original standalone Ghost in the Shell game. Sugar and Rockets wouldn't last long. From their formation in 1997, they were consolidated and assimilated in 2000. Team Eco was formed in 1997 and led by Fumito Ueda. Team Eco would develop Eco and the original Shadow of the Colossus. Their third game, The Last Guardian, entered development hell for years and Fumita Ueda would depart Team Eco in 2011. He then formed Gen Design outside of Sony in 2014 with many members of Team Eco, where The Last Guardian's development would finally finish. Project Siren was formed in 1999 by former members of Team Silent, the creators of the original Silent Hill. This team would develop all three games in the Siren series, two on the PlayStation 2 and one on the PlayStation 3. Project Siren later became known as Team Gravity in 2012 during the development of the Gravity Rush games. And of course, last but not least, Team Asobi was formed in 2012 by Nicholas Doucet, who had previously worked for Sony's London studio. Team Asobi had developed all of the Playroom and Astro games, with Astro's Playroom being the game that spun Team Asobi into their own separate studio under the PlayStation Studios brand in April 2021. From acclaimed titles to underrated gems, Japan Studio's support for PlayStation was immense. However, as times changed, Japan Studio would face its own difficulties, and the studio's wandering methods caused them to fall behind on updated development tools and methodologies, ultimately not having a clear direction going forward on their games. This resulted in many of Japan Studio's PS3 releases to struggle. In 2011, Sony would take action. Alan Becker would be brought in from Santa Monica Studio to lead Japan Studio onto a better and more straightforward path for success. Over 40 games in development were cancelled, games that weren't likely to be successful. But thanks to Alan Becker's implementation of a more western approach to development, Japan Studio was able to get back on track resulting in games like Puppeteer and Rain, with a bigger push on finishing and releasing The Last Guardian. Despite these attempts, things would only get worse for Japan Studio. Throughout late 2020 and early 2021, many notable Japan Studio employees departed the company. Sony had decided not to renew the contracts of those associated with Japan Studio except those part of Team Asobi. All of this will lead to Japan Studio being dissolved and reorganized into Team Asobi and other Sony Interactive Entertainment Studios. Though this could be foreshadowed years prior in 2016, when Sony Interactive Entertainment moved their headquarters from Japan to the US in California, effectively starting their exit out of Japan and westernizing the brand. Now Japan Studio may be gone, but their games continue to be remembered like Parappa the Rapper. It's often credited as the start of the music rhythm genre. It's a completely bizarre tale of a rapping dog trying to woo a flower, but that's what makes it so memorable. The songs are catchy and extremely odd, but the beat is something everyone can get behind. Following the on-screen commands can sometimes prove frustrating, but the game has many great qualities to it. From its iconic first stage with an onion as a karate teacher, to a temperamental chicken who puts seafood in her cake, Parappa the Rapper is still celebrated today. Both its spin-off Um Jeremy Lammy and Parappa the Rapper 2 continue this craziness, but it completely increases it. Sadly, Parappa never had a third game, but we could all use another round of rapping zaniness, can't we? 1995's Jumping Flash is often credited as the first platforming video game in 3D. Unique on its release, it wouldn't be long until other 3D platformers took center stage, but Jumping Flash would find its own success with Jumping Flash 2 and a third game that was only released in Japan. Doko Demo Isio, or in English Together Everywhere, is a game developed by Beckside. 
It's a game about communication. Players pick from one of five characters to interact with through words and phrases. Its biggest feature was compatibility with the pocket station, and the game could typically be found bundled with it. Despite multiple characters, the character of Tora was popular enough to not only take over the series with appearances from the other characters, but also became Sony Japan's official mascot. The series is more known in Japan, but Toro and his friends have made a few appearances in the West, mainly guest starring in a number of games like Little Big Planet, PlayStation All Stars Battle Royale, and Street Fighter Cross Tekken. There was a time when Sony was heavily involved in not just AAA games, but also smaller digital experiences, something that has seemingly died out at the start of the PlayStation 4. But Japan Studio had a handful of exclusive PSN games for PS3. Japan Studio would criticize the concept of Tokyo Jungle, but the story of animals fighting for survival on the abandoned streets of Tokyo would prove popular. Rain is a beautiful game where a young boy helps out a young girl against various enemies in a Paris-inspired city, but they are all invisible and can only be seen in the rain. It lacks in replayability, but it's an incredible puzzle-like adventure everyone should experience. The last guy sees the player guiding civilians to safety in monster-infested cities, with each map using satellite images from Google Earth to render these cities. Echo Chrome will put your mind to the test with its puzzling gameplay where perspective is key, and its sequel, Echo Chrome 2, requires the PlayStation Move and uses the perspective of shadows to guide the mannequin to the goal and there is still plenty more available on the PlayStation 3 store. Kung Fu Rider is an often overlooked PlayStation Move exclusive, and honestly with good reason. It's wonky with the required motion controls, but the game's concept is very fun. The goal of the game is simple, escape from the triads in Hong Kong, because private investigator Tony and his secretary have become their most wanted. And the only way to do this is to navigate the various streets of Hong Kong on a rolling office chair. This ridiculous concept can only come from Japan Studio, and that's why it's so great. Grind, dodge, jump, and spin kick your way through various obstacles and enemies to the finish line. It's a level-based game where each level offers its own challenges to unlock new items to ride on with their own perks. Now, if only this game could also be played on a standard controller. Chances are you've heard it before, but Puppeteer is a highly underrated PlayStation 3 game. Released in September 2013, it was so close to the November launch of the PlayStation 4. Many overlooked this game, likely due to Sony's undermarketing, and people probably already sold their PlayStation 3s in anticipation for Sony's next big console. Even Shuhei Yoshida regrets not releasing Puppeteer on the PlayStation 4. Sadly, it's mismanagement that failed Puppeteer, not the game itself. But if you have a PlayStation 3 and are able to buy the game, Puppeteer is well worth it. It's Japan Studio at its finest with a memorable experience that might just make you lose your head. But like they say, the show must go on. Ape Escape was the very first video game to acquire the use of PlayStation's new DualShock controller in 1999, which featured dual analog sticks. One stick would move the character and the other would control a selected weapon. The series would go on to have many sequels and spin-offs on many of PlayStation's consoles and handhelds, but would stop after its first release on the PlayStation 3, PlayStation Move Ape Escape, a first-person on-rails game that took what Ape Escape was about, but spun it in a new direction. The Monkey Madness is still remembered today, with many dying for a new entry, especially when a number of excellent titles are still exclusive to Europe and Japan. Developed by Clapham's, Everybody's Golf, formerly known as Hot Shots Golf in North America, has been a long-running franchise for Sony appearing on almost every PlayStation console and handheld since the beginning. Thanks to its three-click shot system and fun cartoon characters, the game is easy to get into but difficult to master. And then there are the fun crossover appearances from characters like Sackboy, Kratos, and Toro. The older PS1 games are much more difficult to get into, but its most recent entry on the PlayStation 4 is very welcoming for everyone. Funny enough, the developers of the very first game, Camelot, will go on to develop the Mario Golf series for Nintendo. While the Airboys Golf series lies in limbo, Clapham's has moved on with a spiritual successor called Easy Come Easy Golf for the Apple Arcade and Nintendo Switch, and hopefully we'll see a release on PlayStation in the future. Fantavision was a PlayStation 2 launch title. In fact, it's the only first party title in the console's launch lineup. The reason for this? Sony didn't want to quickly release its own projects and compete with the high number of third party games the console had. Phantom Vision is a puzzle game where you select three or more flares of the same color 
to detonate the fireworks for a high score. There's more to it than this, of course, but it's a simple concept that gets more challenging as the game goes on. The main purpose of Fantavision was to showcase the particle effects the PlayStation 2 could display due to its internal emotion engine. It was created at a time when many developers were transitioning from the original PlayStation to the PlayStation 2. The game was created by a team of 3 to 5 people in just 6 months, and was one of the final games Shuhei Yoshida supervised before departing Japan's studio for a higher position within Sony. Though the team and Yoshida himself would be ridiculed by Japan studio for working on such a small scale puzzle game, despite the newer hardware being able to do so much more. Knack was the launch title for the PlayStation 4, and it sure is something else. It's not one of Sony's finest games, and because of this, Knack became a joke online. Knack was meant to revive the mascot games of yesteryear, but Knack really missed this mark. Said to be a mix of Crash Bandicoot, Katamari Damacy, and God of War, the game and Knack himself just weren't memorable. It's the first game written and directed by Mark Cerny, a consultant for PlayStation hardware and development since the PS1 days, and the game wasn't without its development issues. Like Fantavision, Knack also seemingly has a purpose technically speaking, and that would be to show the amount of relics Knack can attach to his body or lose, thus increasing or decreasing his size right in the game. The game would receive a sequel, Knack 2, that many overlooked. Ultimately, Knack 2 is a much better game and is what you want to see in a sequel, where nearly everything has been improved on. Knack 2 is the game Knack should have been, and it's the game you want to play. But Knack should be played first because so much of its story is referenced in the sequel. With their background on Silent Hill, Project Siren's first game would be the 2003 PlayStation 2 horror game, Siren. What made Siren different than other horror games at the time was the ability to sightjack enemies. This allows the player to see through the eyes of another, to see and hear what's happening in the area to progress. Its creepy Japanese setting revolves around an interconnected cast where the actions of one character can affect another. However, its 2006 sequel would never be released in North America due to low ratings of the original game. And in 2008, Siren Blood Curse would reimagine the original game for the PlayStation 3. Its story split into 12 chronological episodes. Although its release was so long ago, this game still looks gorgeous, and will pump you full of adrenaline and scares thanks to its atmosphere. Honestly, Sony is a fool for not returning to this series. Horror games have been making a huge comeback, and Siren should be one of those. After the completion of the Siren trilogy, Project Siren would later rename themselves to Team Gravity for the development of one of PlayStation Vita's biggest highlights, Gravity Rush. The shift from a horror series like Siren to an action-adventure game like Gravity Rush came out of increasing development costs and decreasing revenue for horror games. The game was originally developed for the PS3, but after learning about the PlayStation Vita and its gyroscope system, this technology helped to emphasize the gravity-based gameplay and development shifted to the Vita. But low sales of the Vita meant that not many people played the game and a remaster of the game successfully came out onto the PlayStation 4 for a wider audience to enjoy the gravity-bending adventures of Cat. And Cat is a great, lovable, and cute character who will kick your ass in a heartbeat. If you can play Gravity Rush Remastered, that is where the game really shines, and thankfully Sony allowed this game to have a second chance. And when you're done playing that, play Gravity Rush 2. That game is purely mind-blowing. It does everything a sequel should do and triples that. The graphics are gorgeous, the story is deeper, and the open world is greatly increased. Both titles are highly underrated, but Gravity Rush 2 always feels like it's been forgotten more. While they didn't help Sucker Punch develop Ghost of Tsushima, Japan Studio did act as a consultant for the studio. They flew members of Sucker Punch to Japan and Tsushima Island for guided tours with a historian and connected them with historians to consult on the factual relevance of the story. It's one of Sony's first party studios helping out another, and that in itself is great to hear about. And in 2020, Japan Studios' final two games will be released on launch with the PlayStation 5 console, the first being a Demon's Souls remake by Bluepoint Games. Despite its IP being owned by Sony, they never published the PlayStation 3 original outside Japan, a choice they would regret for many years, but fix that mistake with one of the most beautiful games on the system. The second game would be Astro's Playroom by Team Asobi, a technical demo in itself, but one that's highly enjoyable and comes highly recommended as the first game you need to play on the PlayStation 5. Not only is it a perfect introduction to the PlayStation 5's capabilities and an excellent platforming adventure, but in its own way is a sweet send-off to the legacy of Japan Studio with its many references and easter eggs to their games. Eco, Shadow of the Colossus, and The Last Guardian by Team Eco are probably three of the most beautiful, thought-provoking, and emotional tales you can play. Each tile was directed by Fumito Ueda, and typically had various similarities, but were not sequels to one another. 
The level of immersion that player has in these games is incredible, with each environment speaking for itself. In North America, Eco would often be overlooked due to its unexciting exclusive box art and lack of marketing, something Sony did a lot in those early PS2 days. Despite this, the game beautifully shows that people from different backgrounds who speak different languages can come together. Shadow of the Colossus, however, is probably one of the most talked about games in the series. Groundbreaking for the time on the PS2, there was immense scale between the player and the giant climbable colossi that was never seen before, and the game was a success thanks to a bigger push by Sony. The Last Guardian was first announced in 2007 as one of the PlayStation 3's next biggest titles, but numerous delays and struggles developing the game on the PS3 would enter the game into development hell. The Last Guardian itself is proof that a game in development hell can make it through, and like previous entries, there are many callbacks to Ueda's previous games, such as Teamwork and the grand scale of the Beast Trico. The 2018 Shadow of the Colossus remake by Bluepoint Games enhances the beauty of its world and respects the original, making it the definitive version you should play. Now, if only we could have a remake of Eco Sony, that would be lovely. And that's only some of Japan Studios' games. Even today, Japan Studios' legacy continues to live on. Fantavision received a sequel 23 years later on the PlayStation 5 and PSVR 2, a sequel called Fantavision 22X. PlayStation Productions have announced a live-action Gravity Rush film, and many of their games are still playable on the PlayStation 4 and PlayStation 5. PS2 emulations like Ape Escape 2, Parappa the Rapper 2, and Siren can be purchased. Parappa the Rapper, Loco Roco, and Patapon remasters are available. And despite the relaunch PlayStation Plus being a bit underwhelming, a ton of classic PS1 and PSP games by Japan Studio have been released such as Ape Escape, Hot Shots Golf, and No Heroes Allowed. And of course, Team Asobi is still around, the last sliver of Japan Studio's legacy. Astro's Playroom brought them immense success, and thankfully they are dedicated to retaining that Japanese flair within their games. We can likely expect more Astro in the future, but they are also planning on developing some new original games as well. Creativity is something PlayStation Studios isn't lacking, but the games developed by Japan Studio always have their own unique flair. There will never be something like Japan Studio again, and every time one of their titles came out, you just knew you were in for some weird, unusual, creative, unique experience you couldn't find anywhere else. Some of their games may not have been AAA bangers or have been instant hits, but Japan Studio specialized in creating games that left important memories for every single person who played their games. There was nothing more rewarding than that in itself. Japan Studio was Sony's oldest first-party studio. Any studio closing is tragic. People lose their jobs. The identity that was that studio was gone, but with Japan Studio, that identity was there right from the beginning. It was one of PlayStation's biggest supporters. Japan Studio isn't just a studio closure, it's a symbol of change within PlayStation. Whether that change is good or bad, well, that's up for you to decide. Let me know in the comments below, what are your favorite Japan Studio games? Do you think Sony shuttering Japan Studio was a mistake? Please be sure to like and subscribe for future content. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.